My guest today is Hartej Sani, the CEO and founder of Zokio. Zokio.io is a auditing firm for Web3 companies, specifically for blockchain smart contract auditing. Auditing is an incredibly important part of launching any blockchain or smart, smart contract project and Hartej has been doing it for a long time. We talked about the origin, how he started the business originally in Vegas and grew it and ended up crashing it or closing it down only to start Zokyo later as a completely decentralized remote uh, company. So we talked about what they're doing exactly, why auditing and blockchain is so important and difficult. We moved on to discuss what venture and web three investing looks like today what are the unique attributes of the web three crypto investors compared to web two and then we touched on some geopolitics how decentralization us china india are playing a major role and the trade-off between privacy and safety hope you enjoy the conversation as much as i did here is hartej sani All right, Hartej, let's just pick up where we were going. We had such a great pre-show here. So we were talking a little bit about your journey, which was all over. You are one of the most traveled, uh, cultured men I've met. Uh, of the different places you've lived and in, in your background, what were some of the most um, influential parts of your worldview now? Obviously, given your time in Ukraine and the relevance of the war, I imagine that has to be a part of it. Your time in Vegas, getting in more familiar with crypto, but how do you sort of view the landscape of the world and what's influenced you? So I got to be honest, the uh, computer line, the internet line, the questions, I'm going to have to have you repeat it, please. Yeah, sure. Just, yeah. just wanted to ask you about your, what, what places that you've lived have been the most influential in your perspective, your worldview? Every chapter has its own positives and negatives. You know, when I lived in Vegas, I was just in a different uh, mindset. I was fortunate to be amongst uh, a lot of people that were um, a little bit more experienced, older than me by 10 to 15 years, including Tony Shea, uh, who was a CEO of Zappos, um, people like Gabriel Shepard. Um, I had a lot of mentors and smart people that were around me in downtown Las Vegas, and I was able to learn a lot from them. And, and there's lessons along the way. When I was in Kiev, Ukraine, I was exposed to really immersing myself in a culture that was very different than uh, the one at least I was raised in. Uh, and the one that in, in the house in my culture is Punjabi, our roots are from India, and I was born and raised in Princeton, New Jersey. Um, and I've been living for the last four and a half years in Kiev, Ukraine, and, uh, I've immersed myself in that culture and I'm grateful that they were so welcoming, uh, in such a beautiful city. Uh, I do miss it. I hope I can go back. Um, you know, I, um, but you know, <clears throat> I learned a lot. In each chapter in, in Las Vegas, the responsibilities of running a Bitcoin meetup and being a part of that community were kind of falling on my shoulders for a bit. Um, I was grateful to be friends with basically people who are very passionate about Bitcoin and Ethereum at a very early stage, including Yo Sub Kwan, who essentially saved me from staying in FinTech and dealing with really long fail cycles in the restaurant industry, restaurant point of sale. We were doing FinTech for restaurant point of sale payments. We we're trying to help big restaurants accept EMV chip and pin cards while integrating to the legacy POS. And I was flying around the country trying to get huge restaurant groups to sign on to the software. Meanwhile, all I really read about and cared about was crypto and especially Bitcoin at that time. And like, I would give lectures to my friends about freedom and how SoundCloud could be on Bitcoin and you can make microtransactions and my friends eventually just bought a bunch of Bitcoin that I couldn't afford and made, became really rich. And, uh, mm. you know, in 2016, I had to do something and that's when I started Hosho. <laughs> and that the entry point in for you was auditing for a crypt, in particular for auditing the blockchains prior to them going live or what, what specifically was the early niche in where yeah. they found some product market fit. So in 2016, uh, late. Yosef Kwan in Las Vegas, who, you know, he himself is a, he's an engineer. He's an, a, a great architect. He's able to read smart contracts and audit them himself. And, you know, it's, uh, 
he calls me and we basically realize that there's critical vulnerabilities that can be found with someone's bare naked eyes without running any tooling. Some of these tokens are already listed on exchanges. Some of them we've already invested in, in ourselves with our own capital. And, uh, someone needs to be auditing these smart contracts and telling exchanges that they should not be listing a token that's not been audited. And we started researching. And at that time we found there was a few companies, two or three companies focused on auditing smart contracts, but most of them, well, all of them at that time had a division within their company that was auditing smart contracts. And we decided, well, you know, as young bucks, we we're like, we're just going to focus on blockchain cybersecurity. And that's it. Like we're a company that just does blockchain cybersecurity stuff. And we started with auditing smart contracts. We expanded into penetration testing. And then we moved into um, basically anything that a wire hacker is capable of doing, right? Which, you know, it just started uh, moving on into things like compliance, which we do now. We do ISO, SOC 2, PCI. Uh, at least back in 2016, 2017, it was tough to convince someone to get an audit and a penetration test. And it still kind of is, to be honest. People, uh, you know, they're more up to date on auditing and wanting multiple audits, but penetration testing, penetration testing or source code auditing or checking for uh, data leaks in your cloud security. Um, there's not a lot of standardization or demand in the web three space yet, uh, due to a long list of reasons. Um, so that was up to point. just auditing a crazy number of smart contracts during the ICO boom, mostly on Ethereum in solidity mm. and, you know. It fast forwards to today, you know, we're operating on EVM, non-EVM, move everywhere. And was this familiar to you given the background that you had, or what was the kind of connection that you had to your, your co-founder who had more experience in auditing blockchains? My experience was building startups. Uh, I, I built companies and I had been geeking out about crypto. I had been reading everything there to know about it, but from a non-technical perspective, I, you know, I know the basics of Python, but I knew very early in my career that if I'm the one coding, I'm going to, I'm going to be poor. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, mm -hmm. that's not my forte and I'm not focused there. Um, I'm, I'm better at building a business. I'm better at hiring. I'm better at having a vision. Uh, I'm better at raising capital, deploying it. Um, and so, um, it was a good yin and yang situation. Yeah. Yo is a actual security expert, you know, it was actually technical. Um, I just kept, kept keeping up and, uh, asking lots of mm -hmm. questions. And, and so, you know, that my background was in finance in college. I went to Penn state. I grew up in New Jersey and I was built, I was in FinTech focused on payments and point of sale. And I just fell deep down the, uh, crypto. Um, as some people call it a rabbit hole, I feel like some people hate when you call it a rabbit hole. So I'm going to call it a rabbit hole yeah. if you don't like it. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> That's fun. What's the general price tag for a, say a blockchain is getting spun up. What's the, what's the like prototypical structure of this project? It's, you know, I would imagine it's an LLC with a bunch of developers, maybe three, four, five that have some angel funding maybe from private investors and they want to like go from test net to main net. like wh what's kind of like the classic example that you would run into and then how much are they typically looking to spend on an audit so smart contract audits differ greatly from protocol audits so a blockchain protocol audit typically they'll go uh to an auditor all projects blockchain or protocol sh or smart contracts should be going to multiple auditors multiple third-party auditors that are qualified after doing multiple internal audit and writing your own tooling and test suites. But a smart contract audit is far more typical than an entire blockchain or even portions of that blockchain. Cause well, there's far more tokens being created and smart contracts being written than there are layer one and two protocols. So, um, what's easier to kind of ballpark in today's, uh, industry is definitely what is the cost of a typical token generation, maybe an ERC 20 solidity smart contract. Um, I'd say anywhere as in the range of 10, as low as 10 K, um, all the way up to six figures, hundred, 120 K. Uh, it really varies based on complexity and timing. A lot of people's pipelines are really full. Um, 
Sometimes people give us extremely complicated multi-chain cross-chain smart contracts that you have to rack your brain around. Uh, the thing about auditing that often people are not uh, discussing is that, so VCs, for example, VCs really like to hear things are getting automated, right? They love everything being automated, right? It's because it's like SaaS, so you're going to make more money, retainer payments, mm -hmm. automate, automate, automate. And so in 2018, we tried to raise VC capital from all the name brand VCs as an auditor who had crushed it and done more INCO audits than anyone else in the industry. And they all said, why would we invest in a services business? Some of them even said, you're not even going to have a business as an auditor in a couple of years because of formal verification, right? And this is like the, some of the biggest thought leaders in the space, um, who we still have respect for. It's good. It's like this, it happens. It's okay. Um, um, VCs want automation and the biggest critical vulnerabilities today are being found manually from you need two to three auditors to kind of rack their brains around each and every smart contract today and find the flaws in typically is the logic and we're typically finding flaws in, in the logic of the smart contract and, uh, well, not much has changed and well, uh, you need manual smart people with a quality assurance background to, um, think what is the goal of this smart contract and how can I think like a black hat? How could somebody exploit this smart contract? Because exploits are not always critical vulnerabilities. They're not, uh, it's not a vulnerability in this smart contract. You had to think like the black hat and how can I exploit this? Um, and so these are the kind of the things that we're, we're all working hard in the industry. I'm sure all the other auditing firms, uh, we, you know, basically partner with the top tier firms because either we're the first auditor or they're the first auditor. Um, and so we want more and more people to audit code. We want more firms to be out there. We want more firms that are systematically able to handle more work while doing really high quality work out there. Um, and yeah, kumbaya, one love. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you feel like the decision that VCs passed generally almost on the, on the category of auditing as a services business, do you think that was a miss? Like, uh, I think of VC as typically, you know, you raise as high risk investor capital, one out of 10 time, wins. Let's put it this way. Halborn just raised $90 million and they do exactly what we do. And this was 2018. So I would, that raised 90 million in eight this, this year. This year. Okay. Wow. So I would argue that if they raise 90 million this year, we do exactly the same thing. It's a pretty good deal. Someone was about to get in 2018 and we had a, yeah, yeah. It, didn't even, it didn't even exist at that time. Uh, yeah. Basically when we started and we spent a whole year auditing, there were no firms out there that decided to launch their own token as an auditor. So, you know, we have yeah. a group, we have some owners out there still that back in the ICO days decided to launch their own token. Um, and those firms are still out there as well. Um, some of that, I think of VC funding yeah. as well. I tend to think of VC funding as being ideally for businesses that have a, uh, a high, have a low potential, but a possible potential of a high ratio of market cap to employees. So effectively that's a representation of scale, but there is kind of a, there a tendency for services businesses to have a cap to them. Uh, there's examples of that, that, you know, de defy that logic logic or, or you know, counter that rule. But do you see that being, do you see there being a barrier to entry for auditing businesses in, in crypto or blockchain that then kind of consolidates the market into one or two major players? Or do you think it sort of remains pretty fragmented over the years? I mean, are you asking, is the barrier to entry high to enter the auditing business? Is in, if it is, if it's not high, or if it is, do you see the market consolidating where there tends to be, you know, two or three really large players and they sort of own the market? Uh, so I think what we need at the moment is more, we need, you need firms that are kind of at that sweet spot of size where you're able to make sure 
that you're able to keep your quality really, really high. You have the skill set of running like operationally a clean business so that you're, you're keeping your lead times two weeks, maybe four weeks. You're able to, um, filter through working with the right teams. You're able to hold each team's hand and give them a very personal experience. Um, these things are tough to scale and, uh, you know, groups of independent security researchers often are not, uh, they don't have that skill set to operationally run, uh, with a, a 50 person operation systematically on these smart contracts. Um, uh. right. And so it's really about the right group of people coming together with the right mindset and the right place, right places, you know, um, yeah. I think places is a big key point because, uh, you gotta be out in 24 seven, in my opinion. So that's why we're Vermont first. We have presence in 17 countries. And, uh, I, I did that after building Hosho where our entire office was in Las Vegas. Our whole team was in Las Vegas and we were like, uh, yeah, as soon as that we switched over to Zokio, I, I said, I'm not going to make that mistake again. We're good. This time we're going to go remote first. We're going to give everybody freedom and mission one audit 24 seven. You know, yeah, you know, and in terms of consolidation, I do think there will be consolidation. Uh, I don't know if there's going to be like just three, I think the industry is going to grow tenfold. So we're going to just need more honors that have a unique specialty. We're already seeing some people say, Hey, we have a team of 15. We, as a company specialize on only rust and now move and they're no longer maybe accepting Solidity smart contracts. And you have other folks that say, hey, we specialize and we're bullish on ETH. We only do ETH Solidity smart contracts. Um, and then, you know, you have a lot of other firms that are just trying to go for the whole lot and they raised substantial amounts and they're building big teams. Um, yeah. And so there's going to be, definitely, yeah. there's definitely going to be some acquisitions because of the sheer fact of the this earth doesn't have that many really talented people with the right background and the incentive to want to audit smart contracts. And I think the incentive is a key part because really smart human beings, uh, like it's not always the easiest thing to incentivize them to be auditing smart contracts. There needs to be, um, self-interest passion in this, for this industry, um, there, they want to be, they have to have the right mindset to want to be learning all the time and to have a QA mindset and to find excitement in that. Um, but even that, I think, uh, most of these people are excited by focusing on learning on other parts of this industry. Maybe they're literally building something else in their free time. We do have that, uh, in house mm. and uh, they're building tooling. That's a big part of what we're trying to do. We're trying to build as much tooling as we can, as fast as we can in between auditing smart contracts. But the load is so high that it's tough to get your hands off the actual audit to go build some tooling. And I think that's yeah, a, yeah. Not, an, not an uncommon problem. You know, that we're all, everybody's growing. We're all growing. Even in the yeah. bear market, we're growing. Yeah, maybe especially. What do you think of the, uh, are there any projects that stand out to you as having misplayed the auditing process, either done it far too late or not at all and played a, a major, paid a major price for that? I mean, I, I think of, uh, in May, obviously Celsius and the, the Terra Luna projects, those are, you know, high level projects. Are, are those kind of a, a casualty of not having enough auditing or. No, there were some, there were some clear cases where, uh, somebody found a critical vulnerability in a smart contract after multiple audits were done. Um, I I'd rather not bring up those names, nor would I rather bring up the auditors that audited. Um, there's the cases are all out, out there, but I think on that topic of hacks, what's really interesting is two things. One, the finger always gets pointed to the auditor. And mm. what's actually interesting is in some of the most notable hacks, it wasn't actually a vulnerability in the smart contract. It was the company having poor operational security, not having a chief security officer in charge, or if they do have one, then he or she is not doing the right thing which is uh -huh. you need to have proper phishing training because people are phishing 
low-level employees and gaining access to validator nodes. And um, this is not because of the vulnerability in the smart contract. It's not, a, not a technical issue. Yeah, it's not a vulnerability in the smart contract. This is, someone got fished. Someone clicked the wrong email. Um, and there's a very simple, uh, you can Google very simply the, the task of the CISO at a company and uh, what they do for in-house cybersecurity practices. People have quarterly phishing training. They check for two-factor authentication. Does everyone use corporate laptops? They make sure very limited people have access to the office Wi-Fi router. They are very mindful of the, the internal operations of the office. Who's allowed in the office? Who's allowed to touch computers? Do you know everyone in the office? Like, is the door locked? Can someone just walk in here? There's a nation state people trying to join your company. You're in Web3. And they are mm. trying to get in there, you know, there are nation state actors from North Korea being sent to apply for a job at your D5 protocol. And if you work as employee number 145 at Coinbase, maybe, or maybe 1,145, and you think, you know what, I'm like a low level employee. I'm just chilling. No one cares about me. I only got one BTC. Sadly, you are a target. Because it doesn't matter that you only have one BTC. The hacker thinks that you have a thousand BTC. You work at Coinbase. Mm. You're a target. You're saying, you're, the, 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 and this is to say not Coinbase specifically, but that, that companies or pr I guess projects any uh, company that, in that crypto, have keys. Basically, any company in crypto, if you work in Web3, you work in crypto, you are, whether you're a co founder or your employee, 1,000 or 2,000 or 100 or four, you are a target. And I find that that is a pill that people in our industry find difficult to swallow. And for them to start thinking about their world's, their personal lives, operational security a bit differently. And yeah. it, starts, it starts with your, your, your wife, your family, your loved ones, your kids, your, your parents. And then it goes, extends to your just core. You start a company. And like when we invest in companies, we ask some very basic questions. Like, is everyone using a company laptop? Have you guys ever heard of your used UB keys? Do you currently use UB keys? I will mail you a, a big bag of UB keys with your company logo on it. If we invest in you, use them, you know, mm -hmm. put one on your neck, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. like ba the, ba the basic cybersecurity shower is needed yeah. way more in our industry. Yeah. And like people don't have the incentive to even hire somebody who's in charge of security at a really early stage. And so like, and what, what do you think <laughs> speaking, speaking generally about this, I, I would imagine that most people are familiar with like the auto responses to Elon Musk when he tweets about, you know, some Bitcoin giveaway, there's simple. And at this point played out tactics of, you know, don't give me 0.1 BTC to buy a ticket into this giveaway kind of thing. Maybe that comes through on an email. In what ways do you see or anticipate these either state actors or sophisticated black hats getting more successful or tactical with their approaches? Is it like, 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 oh yeah, maybe, maybe we, some we, things come to They are already very tactical. The, the biggest bridges in our industry are being attacked by nation state actors. And like, we have groups from North Korea and different places in the world that I'd rather not name that are definitely going after our bridges. They are very lucrative assets with hundreds of millions and if not billions of dollars flowing through that, you know, there's not that many bridges that you could name that have not been hacked you know, hot protocol, which by the way, I've not invested in backed, audited, nothing. But hot protocol is one of the, one of the only bridges that has yet to been hacked. Maybe it has something to do with the fact that the co-founder and CEO is one of the best auditors himself in the space. Mm. And what's just to, just to spell it out simply, a bridge is a, a piece of decentralized technology sitting on multiple servers that allows people to move between one cryptocurrency and another, maybe you can elaborate on what the, why bridges are a target and how they're generally 
constructed. Yeah. Tommy, basically the future of this industry is multi-chain and cross-chain and we have mm -hmm. more and more people solving for this dilemma of being able to send information at a macro scale, uh, between different chains and different protocols. And so we've had a lot of different people taking a stab at this problem. Um, uh, in the cross-chain messaging protocol world, the big names to kind of research into and see that have taken a really big stab at this with very significant backing and strong teams on one end, you have layer zero, which covers all the EVMs as well as now Aptos as the, one of the leading in messaging protocols. And on the other side, you've got wormhole and wormhole is backed by jump and they cover the EVMs plus Solana. And I think they've already, they also are covering mist and labs as we, the new blockchain. Um, and, uh, I think many projects will end up using both of these cross chain messaging protocols because they want redundancy and, you know, increasingly, I think a corporate fortune 500 mindset is entering lab three where people are not competing, but they're saying, I want redundancy. Uh, we're going to mm -hmm. be putting billions of dollars through two different chains. We want to launch on Solana and Sui. We're going to use wormhole or we're going to do Aptos and Ethereum, and we're going to use layer zero in between. Um, that's really interesting. And I think that we're in a very interesting time that we're back to layer one wars. And we thought they were over, but I think layer one wars are not, not wars. It's just new layer ones in a layer, in a multi-chain cross-chain future, because we have a maturity of cross-chain messaging protocols that are out there. Um, and we're taking a big stab at bridges. There's different types of bridges that are out there. Some are data bridges, some are, you know, and we don't even know how to monetize data bridges at the current moment. Uh, it's almost like a public service. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and we're, as an industry, we're kind of just figuring out how to properly do bridges. I don't know how this will play out in terms of bridges. Like, will there be a winner takes all that we as an industry just, uh, choose to go with, um, and they figure it out, they crack the nut. I don't know. Um, mm. but for now, in terms of like crossing messaging protocols, uh, it's a good to keep an eye on layer zero wormhole. Then you have Axelar, Dbridge. Dbridge is definitely an interesting one. <coughs> we actually recently audited Dbridge. So I really like that team. I really like what they're doing. Yeah. I mean, cross chain messaging protocols are definitely a, a worthy rabbit hole along with ZK gaming. Um, yeah, sweet, sweet move. <laughs> and they tend to be these bridges tend to be the spot that a a group of hackers would target because of the uh, amount of liquidity lack locked up in it. Ah, uh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's liquidity locked up in the bridge. Why would there be so much liquidity in a bridge? Would wouldn't the pr purpose of a bridge to move money between blockchains quickly? I mean, essentially, you're. You're locking or burning tokens on the source chain through a smart contract and unlocking or minting the tokens through another smart contract. Um, and so these are the bridges and everyone's taking a different stab at how to do it. Mm. Right. Um, yeah, but yeah. Like, I mean, token bridges are the ones that typically use the cross chain messaging protocol. Right. And mm. so, um, you know, you want to move tokens between blockchains. All right, let's use a cross chain messaging protocol. And that's why I was blabbering about layer zero wormhole, Epsilon, Dbridge. Those are four <laughs> that I can listen on the top of my head that are just really innovative in what's happening there. Very, very exciting what's happening there. And it's a big part of the narrative for these two new blockchains, Sui and Aptos. Yeah. Is your intuition, or maybe you have a more firm opinion on this, but do you feel like we're in the earlier stages <laughs> of, uh, like I think of email protocols and just HTTP and HTTPS and <laughs> TCP IP, these protocols are like the weathered, right? Like I can't, it, it would be a shock to me if I woke up tomorrow and Gmail was hacked and somebody got it. Like, it <laughs> seems like we're kind of at a stable state. It doesn't feel that way to me from an outsider on the protocols and crypto, do you feel like we're approaching a stable state in a year, a couple of years, or just a far, far away? Or it depends on every new protocol that comes out. I think that a lot of critical infrastructure has yet to be built mm. in Web3 
Um, but we are reaching a point at which in between certain critical moving parts, like the ones that I just named and some of the more serious decentralized custody players that are leveraging cryptographic tools like multi-party computation. And so when you combine a bunch of moving parts, like massive institutions already into the industry, multiple, uh, world-class cryptographers building custody solutions, check. Uh, secure, decentralized and centralized exchanges, more or less check, right? Uh, and in each of these little spaces, you've got at least five to 10 very substantial players in different parts of the world or all of the world taking a hard stab backed by at least two to $500 million each, or they already have that themselves, meaning that none of these major infrastructure companies are going anywhere. Um, we're reaching a point where a fortune 500 company in the next one to three years, if they connect the right dots and they look in the right places, then they can launch a institutional grade solution today. And like, that wasn't even true. We didn't have a lot of these moving parts where you can put them together. Not that long ago, you know, um, there's, for example, companies leveraging multi-party computation. You've got, it started with this guy, Yehuda Lindell, a professor from Israel who some say he invented multi-party computation. I think there's some controversy there. I don't know. All I know is that when I studied it on YouTube. All the videos are from Technion University, Israel, and there's a lot of Israelis that think know a lot about cryptography. So it's mm -hmm. very impressive. And, uh, then there's the year to Lindell started unbound. They got acquired by, I believe Coinbase or Kraken, one or the other. Then you got, uh, Fireblocks, Curve Wallet, Credo, QREDO, Copper. And I believe there's like at least 10 people popping up right now sending the, the deck falling on my desk, uh, for trying to compete with one of them with a different approach, but they're all leveraging right. multi-party computation to tackle custody and custody is just a massive problem. Some are doing it decentralized. Some are doing it centralized. Some leverage MPC on a blockchain, some don't. Mm -hmm. Um, but my point is that, you know, with critical infrastructure, like Credo married with someone as mature as FTX or Binance, um, right in between there could be a bulge bracket bank thanks to mm. the technology that is available today. And mm. so a lot is possible like right now, you know, mm. when you zoom out and you think about it from the perspective of a retail user in the billions using a decentralized application, that's, that's the next wave. And I think it's going to come with gaming the way we had a DeFi summer. We're about to have a gaming summer. There's going to be finally multiple games <clears throat> that are actually fun and they're not just investments. And so, you know, when your kid walks up to you and is playing some game or your mom, your dad, your grandpa is playing some game, you know, they're going to be issued, uh, you know, a dynamic NFT and on chain app that, and they're and the, I think uh, the next billion users will come via gaming. Uh, and, you know, personally, very much looking forward to the SWE blockchain and the way they've innovated on-chain assets and dynamic NFTs and parallel transactions. So keeping a close eye on, on that blockchain specifically and their approach to gaming, because on that blockchain, a world-class gaming developer could launch a game without smart contract expertise. And Swiss developed some very interesting SDKs to ease the, the friction of a gaming developer to launch a game in web three and to leverage the the fruits of what web three has to offer there. Right? And so excited to see that play out. What are, what are the attributes from a user's or a gamer's perspective will drive the rocket ship of, of web three gaming? Will, will it be the appeal of having NFT based skins in the game that you can move between? And that's just so exciting. Uh, I've heard play to earn yet. I'm not very excited or I don't see the major appeal of how that applies to the mass market. I think dynamic NFTs, 
dynamic NFTs will be the first part. And there is a lot to say about in in game items. We that's been like the the dream for a really, really long time. Everyone's been talking about, you know, uh, can I trade my in game item that I spent so many hours to earn? Can I go trade it for another item? Can I actually have proof of owning it? I invested a week of my life in this game and I earned a pink shield. Let me take this pink shield and own it, like possibly for mm. life, or let me go trade it for an X amount of ETH for someone's gun that he spent a month to earn. You yeah. Know? Or, and now, yeah. of course, it's expanding into things like my Yeezys or my Nike shoes that I'm wearing in the games, and it's going from game to game. There's been a lot of controversy on that subject because the the world's biggest gaming developers, starting with people like Fortnite, have had closed ecosystems. You know, mm -hmm. and only only Call of Duty had an open ecosystem where you could earn a skin and then go on somewhere like D Market or Engine and like do something with it. So I I mean yeah, and that's just the D Market and Engine. We were just getting warmed up into what's about to pop off. Yeah. And the pop is really representative of the liquidity and, and open, really open liquidity. It's as if you were to, I think of it in say a context of a ticket for a sporting event. If I had a ticket to a NFL game, I, th th this is, this is kind of in some ways similar because there's a firsthand and a secondhand market. The StubHub is a open publicly traded company that manages secondhand trading. So that would be, uh, you know, effectively some kind of centralization around uh, this specific ticket, which you could think of as an NFT. There's one ID to it that's associated with one entry. And then there's also the like closed garden firsthand sales, which is only issued by one. So yeah, it does seem like the liquidity just creates almost new and innovative ways that people would be able to trade, right? Like they're, they're now able to liquidate things that they wouldn't have had the ability to do previously. And that's now exciting for people. You're creating value where value wouldn't have been possible previously. Yeah. I think NFT ticketing is a clear winning idea for sure. I think, and it, ticket fairies, one of the leading companies spearheading mm -hmm. that because they've been got yes yeah. ticket fairy and ticket master now they're the ticket yeah, fairy protest makes total sense right i mean the whole idea the whole reason why Ticketmaster or the, the like the nfl doesn't want secondhand trading is they don't make money when you sell your ticket secondhand like they don't make money on a sub hub trade but if they could then great i'm sure the whole game would flip it's like okay we take a 10 percent fee or a five percent fee every time you make a trade secondhand market and that that presents counter it's like headwinds against uh, cash flow, against trading it. But if there's enough liquidity and like, I think it, at the end of the day, these things just better meet the market supply and demand is how I think of it. Have you ever seen an NFT of a discretionary asset? Uh, I don't know. What would be an example? So a discretionary asset is something like the parking spot during a basketball game. So right before the basketball match, you're at the stadium, minutes before the game starts, you, you might pay a hundred dollars for a VIP parking spot. You might pay $50 for the upper deck, mm -hmm. right? Ballpark. Maybe it's, it's ripoff. Maybe it's $5 and $10. Okay. Whatever mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. But the point being that when the game starts, the parking spots worth zero. Right. right? The game right. started. Uh, yeah. So, right. And same thing goes for hot dogs. As soon as that fourth quarter ends, the food is worth zero. Going to the garbage. Yeah. It's over. Yeah. Game over. Right? Yeah. And uh, you got to crack that code um, of do I create loyalty by giving away these hot dogs before the game ends that are about to go to the garbage and algorithmically figure out who should get this discretionary asset that's garbage bound. But I can now say, if you spend more than $10 free hot dog, why? Because I love you. Or you start sending these hot dogs out to the highest paying uh, ticket buyers. Or maybe it's everybody who it's their first game, they're automatically mm. sent a free hot dog. And they're just like, why? Because like, we love you. And like little did they know that in less than 11 minutes, that hot dog was about to go in the garbage. 
Mm. Right. So, and so you're, monetizing, or so you're monetizing a discretionary asset. And, uh, yeah, I'm just wondering if you ever came across, I kind of, I didn't say if you ever came across that and it's cool. Well, that was, that was framed that way. Yeah. Well, I think of it, I, when I think of your example there, and there may be more examples of discretionary assets, but particularly that one makes it interesting because it's so time sensitive. So I think of a, a sporting event, which pretty much all events are time sensitive. They're worth a tremendous amount right before, uh, if they're if it's sold out tickets, but then they're worth nothing right after. And that might be things like, uh, I think of like political elections, right? Like it, it matters a ton right before the election. There's all this funding, all this activity. And then after the results no, are out. I don't think elections not, are analogous in this case. Well, there's not, not a, there's not a ticket. <laughs> no, the, the voting mechanism wouldn't be right. But no, the attention I, for people would be right. No. The, Tell me more. We to, I, I meant to see where you're going with this, but no, I don't, I don't see think this is analogous. You know, cause like nothing's about to go to the garbage, but I see men. Oh, okay. 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 Like something so this would be like, uh, this would be like you're on, you're on an airplane and they have, uh, like, uh, there's, they're, they have a lunch items and you know, their plane's about to go down and not, not the plane's about to land Land. and, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they're selling these things for $12 each, but then they're like, Hey, we have all these extras. Do we want to mark it down? And how can they do that intelligently, assuming they just throw these things away at the end of the flight? Yeah. That would be an whatever, example, right? Whatever's about to go whatever is garbage. Whatever's about to go like garbage, yeah. You know? Yeah. So like you got fish, it's about to go bad if it's not eaten on this yeah. plane. Maybe yeah. now that no one, like, let's just say it was economy. And so you have to sell the fish and, uh, you're probably like, okay, look, we got half hour left. When there's half hour left and we're still sitting on some fish, like give it to these people for these reasons. Hmm. Is this how you sort of think loyalty. through? Yeah. It's interesting to think about waste. Like I think of what we're doing here is as modeling out a frame for identifying where opportunity exists, waste that exists is opportunity, yeah. the inverse of it. Do you yeah. think of... Yeah, Circling back a little bit to Zokio, so I, I noticed that the tagline is you are a venture studio that builds, secures, and funds crypto, DeFi, NFT companies. How much of your time or maybe the company's time is split among those? Are you actively talking to and, and debating what you're going to invest in, or is it more focused in-house on building or some combination? So things have evolved, but really at our core, it's a Web3 cybersecurity company full on. And that's really the core focus is, uh, auditing after auditing after auditing is really the bread and butter, the focus. We're just auditing like mad men and mad women. I think we have a lot of, we have actually female auditors. They're awesome. We got a bunch of Ukrainian female engineers and auditors and they're awesome. Um, but, uh, when you audit, you see a lot of deal flow. So we built mm -hmm. an in-house investment team to invest small sums of our own capital and we send a lot of deal flow to a lot of top tier VCs and we help those VCs diligence those projects with our investment team. And a lot of our expertise is already built out in house to be technical and security driven. And we can design and review token economics. And we have a lot of, we have a strong network in the space of VCs, market makers, exchanges who we've been working with for a long time. So it's been a kind of a synergistic fit for us to also learn about uh, what it's like to be an investor over the last two to three years. And so we've had some notable investments and <clears throat> we've done a few incubation projects that, uh, you can deem incubation or maybe studio, uh, everyone, I think <clears throat> in our industry abuses the word incubation. You know, one guy, one person said, I'm teaching you how to do pitch practice. I'll take 6% of your company. And we incubated you. I made a couple intros and the other person's like, I'm going to architect all your technology, design your token economic, you know, maybe help you write a couple smart contracts and I'm incubating you. So I think it's being abused a bit. <laughs> mm. It's like how you got on the cap table. Um, but yeah, we, there's a, we can only incubate a handful of companies per year. So once in a while you come across a team that you are mind blown by and you really want to help these passionate founders achieve their goals. You want to invest. And so sometimes before they could even close capital, we're taking payment for the audit in tokens. We are taking them invested tokens and saying, 
you know, whatever portion needs to be paid in stable coin, you can pay whenever you raise more capital because we want to put in more money into your company in addition to the payment of the audit. And we've helped you design in your token economics and we're introducing you to other investors and helping them diligence it. So it's can, kind of been a very natural evolution. At first, it was just auditing, then auditing expanded to auditing plus penetration testing and cybersecurity. We, you know, uh, then we built a small team out for designing and reviewing token economics. Uh, we expanded into hiring in-house engineers so that we can take on a couple of incubation projects and build some things on our own. At the moment, we're using a lot of our in-house engineering resources to build security tooling and formal verification for Rust and Move and SWE Move. So a lot of focus is going there. Um, but, you know, Zokio at its core, it's Web3 cybersecurity. That's where we're living and breathing. Um, there's, <clears throat> I, I may have some news soon that I'll be more public about. There's some, we're, we have some changes coming and uh, we're looking to uh, have our investment team grow and uh, kind of spawn out um, some things that we're focused on. So I'll keep you posted. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Cause I, I think of this like, uh, like by categorical analogy to a, a typical VC in web two as a VC in web two is really good, especially if you're earlier up the chain, like series C series a, you're good at determining what's possible really by pattern matching. And it's less about the integrity of the the technology and the security of the technology, because you're typically relying like AWS and established infrastructure. And you tend to focus more on the business model, the people, the founders, connections, those kind of things. But I think of what makes a really good Web3 investor tends to be the ability to, yes, understand the model and the actual market opportunity, and also make an assessment of the technology. How impressive is it? How hard is it? How secure is it, et cetera? So the attributes of what a good investor in Web2 to Web3, to, as it stands today, Web3 is just going to be much more technical in, the, in what, what stands out. So you see that with the funds yeah. that are out there now. Making a, bunch uh, of, uh, making a bunch of introductions is just not enough anymore. Right, and, right, and yeah. If, an active involvement with your investment is really what's needed. We need more investors to a run, like run a node, run a validator, know how to do that, have the infrastructure in-house to do that. Um, you have some funds, um, I mean, the top team, the top PCs out there are going to have the in-house capability to have a technical expert actually look at the code of the product that you're about to put money into and look for decentralization flaws and holes. And possibly, you know, what we do is we even look at the code of the company this team previously built. We want to look at the quality of the code of a product that was already shipped. Maybe you sold the last company. We want to look at that company. We want to gauge like, can this team deliver? Can this mm -hmm. CTO build teams that you appointed a CTO? Who is this CTO? What is their experience building teams? What is the quality of this team's code collectively? Has this team built anything together in the past? Right? And like, yeah. um, non-technical diligence, um, you know, it cannot be the only thing relied upon in a web three diligence process. And it's very important to be a ongoing value add and, you know, s fundraising at the seed and pre-seed, uh, is really shrinking in web three companies are raising less yeah. capital at their pre-seed and seed. And a lot of the larger funds are really kind of clawing and fighting to make sure that they have enough allocation because they've got LPs, they have large AUMs and they need to get in. And, yeah. um, right. So if you're going to squeeze in with a large tier one VCs and you are a tier one VC, both all parties in the cap table need to prove why they're there. Why are you there? What value are you bringing so that we can actually execute? And so like web three, we're going to really see a strong evolution of web three VC. We've seen firms like Andreessen and paradigm really build out strong teams of tech and security experts in house. Um, mm. and it'll, it'll be exciting to see how different firms evolve. We've seen some really cool teams pop up. Framework, yeah, final, final global QCP. There's some really great teams out there that are reinventing the wheel and 
uh, they're actively involved with their investments and we're grateful to have a great relationship with them. Well, it does seem like a possibly very successful strategy would be instead of go from VC to value add in terms of developing internal technical capabilities like validator networks and auditing, you'd go the other way around. So I don't know, I have no idea what your plans are, but it sounds like you're in a great position to say, hey, we're going to expand our services to focus also on allocating capital. And you go out and raise some LPs directly and say, hey, like we have the, we have the deal flow, the relationships, the technical ability to screen the companies. It's like, I, that's yeah, kind of, that's kind of all the ingredients. <laughs> yep. I may or may yeah. not be in the process of doing that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, it's a good idea. So regardless of what you're doing now, you should do that. Um, cool. And, uh, I, I would imagine that, you know, that's, it's also less of a big deal, I think, than in web two, because in, it, because it seems to me, it's just easier to put capital in it, that it's less. I mean, push back on this if you if you feel I'm off on this, but in Web2, there's almost a necessity to focus on just capital allocation. Like you don't see very many funds out there in Web2 that are also doing, you know, legal services or auditing or really anything else. Well, um, that's not true, actually. Uh, well, I would mm -hmm. say the top, well, <clears throat> the top tier funds out there in Silicon Valley, even in Web2, um, that's what they, they, they brag about two more. They're able yeah. to really help you. Like for Andreessen, True Ventures, yeah. Kostla, um, Lightspeed, with all of those actually are now also active in Web3. But mm. from a Web2 perspective, I mean, these are people, these are VCs that brag about, hey, we will always have your back on hire. We will always have your back on HR. We will help you find the right talent when you need it. We will help you raise more capital when you need it. Will help you with PR when you need it, right? And so um, I wouldn't say that that's nothing. And yeah, I and and a lot of the newer Web three VCs, I don't think that they have paid enough respect to the pillars of venture capital of Silicon Valley that already has existed. So it wasn't like they quickly took their book, learned it, and said, "I'm going to be like an awesome Web two VC in Web 3 There's not that many of those. Mm. You had a lot of like degen chads that just made a lot of money between a couple of people and then they were able to convince other people who were also basically chads but unqualified chads giving a bunch of people money so you've got a lot of like tier two three four five six seven funds in our industry and they're like oh venture capitalists right mm -hmm. but how yeah. many of them have like taken the time to understand the art of venture capital or you know understand how the North Coast Law or Vein Capital or Sequoia or Pantera or Polychain. I mean, these paradigm, a lot of these funds, how they're take paradigm definitely stands out as one of the earlier funds that cracked the nut of what defines a big Web3 VC. And I mm. think Andreessen is definitely on the same path. Andreessen Crypto, very impressive. Sequoia as well now, but paradigm. They had an in-house, you know, uh, what's his name? They had Samsung, mm -hmm. you know, they had in-house world class, world renowned, full stack, you know, hacker, engineer, builder. So like mm -hmm. <clears throat> they built a squad and you look at paradigms research and it speaks for itself. Um, yeah. Dragonfly mechanism, yeah. electric capital. you got a lot of notable, great firms that are great teams. They know what they're doing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It is really ground up web three investing as opposed to web two, web two approach, which is, it's interesting to dissect it a little bit. I hadn't thought. Well, a, that, a lot uh, of the top web three VCs now add a strong web two VC background, you know, um, look at Lightspeed right now. Uh, I mean, like Lightspeed has that background, they're active. They've invested mm -hmm. into uh, you know, the movie ecosystem actively divested in some core infrastructure. Um, great examples there. You know? Yeah. Let me ask you a little bit, uh, for, for a couple minutes, I can't not, uh, how do you view the technology from a really high level? The whole web three world is playing a role into the, the geopolitics of the earth that we're on. I, you mentioned you were in Ukraine, you left Ukraine for obvious reasons. There, there's a growing centralization of power in China, uh, India as described by biology is the 
greatest power on earth. That's a diaspora. So kind of a worldwide network of sorts. There's uh, oh, obviously Arctic, kind of a, bro. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I would say an increasingly Antarctic leaning American philosophy of, of citizenship. Do you see the decentralized West versus the centralized China as being the, the tension of our coming decades or is there another perspective on it you have? In, in global geopolitics, we are at a, there's a war, a global war on privacy, a, a global war on morality, ethics. Um, and we have a lot of questions to be asking ourselves on, well, you know, what, what do we believe is moral? Do we believe that a human being should have a right to privacy? Do we believe that a human being should have a right to private monetary transactions, to private communication? with their loved ones. Um, these are big questions that need to be asked and thought about. And in web three, we've been thinking about this for a very long time, essentially since the birth of Bitcoin, a lot of people have thought about these things and all of a sudden in the current geopolitical atmosphere, it's becoming a reality that our privacy is being threatened and ripped away from us in so many countries, our fundamental human rights of sovereignty and freedom, life, liberty, and happiness are being ripped away from us in a long list of countries through the excuse of whether it's safety. Safety has been a very big means and to which our fundamental human rights are being ripped away from us globally. And, um, we, the web three is a network state, the way Balaji frames it. He, he framed this very elegantly and it is time that we start fundamentally giving birth to viable network states as a solution to the fact that we are increasingly not feeling a part of maybe the state that we live in and the passport that we were born with. And it's becoming more and more complicated in this digital nomad remote first world for us to collectively as a human species, think about what we really value and that we stand up and fight for those things. Um, because literally in front of our eyes, we are seeing one country stand for freedom and stand for any human being waking up in the morning and pursuing his or her personal passion. And we have other countries moving in the complete opposite direction. And so when it comes to geopolitics, I always tell people to zoom out and say, which you're picking two countries. If you really want me to pick, Let's pick the one that is respecting human freedom. Which country can I launch the next layer of 100 layer two protocol? Where can I build an app? Where can I practice any religion I want? Where can I be free or can I marry whoever I want? Where can I be of any sexuality I want? And I think when you think like that, you zoom out and you start ignoring what the media is very brainwashing you with some small details here and zoom in details there. It's important to just zoom out and you really think about what matters in the world. Um, yeah. and I also think it's a, <clears throat> it's a unique time to create change with all the tools that we have. The internet already exists. And so the speed of web three's growth has been between 200 and 240% year over year since the birth of Bitcoin. And that is because the internet already exists. So we have a unique industry that continues to grow at a rapid rate year over year, regardless of prices fluctuating up or down, uh, we are looking for network effects on layer one blockchains. And you can throw a dart blindly at any of the top layer one protocols that are increasingly getting network effects. Network effects means that you have engineers writing code on those protocols and on those blockchains. And you could throw a dart and invest at any of those layer one protocols don't touch them for a decade and you'll be just fine. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Really look at the, the high level trend, right? Yeah. Like what a unique time. And, uh, at the same time, those very serious questions I asked, like, do humans have a right to send a message to your mom and no one read it? Do you have a right to send money to your loved one, your mother, your father, and no one, uh, track it is oh, what is allowed, right? A lot of people will say, oh, not your keys, not your crypto. And we want to be our own bank and we want the ability to start a new life in a new country and control our own assets. And some people 
don't have the technological capabilities of following that pill and the know-how. Um, but yeah, yeah, I think these, you know, I'll, I'll stop ranting. Yeah. Well, I, I just a quick reflection. I, on some level of right, I, I have an issue with, with the word right because it's, it's cloaked in this idea that it's somehow uh, divinely sovereign, but in reality, it's, it's the, it's like, what, what, what do you have the ability? It's really an ability to do. So if you build a technological infrastructure where there is no ability for a centralized government to read your messages or track you down or et cetera, then- Or decide what you fall in your body. <laughs> right, right. There you go. I, I mean, on, so, on some level, Balaji made a really good point, actually, that the government, in particular, like any state government, could enforce their will on any individual person, but it's not economically possible to- do it to everybody. So they could come to your house, they could find your identity, you know, take your hardware wallet, but that's very expensive. And so they can't distribute that philosophy or enforce that across the board. And that's where it just presents like a counterwind uh, against whatever the state run policy is. And in, in, in the case of like China, you just have their MO has been like widely distributed means of surveillance. So they can just quickly stomp it out because otherwise like in the West, it's not that it's not that different in the West. If you really look at it, it's yeah. a, well, the, Uni <laughs> the United States surveillance wise is not that different from China. If you really dig into it, just China gets, you know, China gets blamed for it and we point fingers at them. But I mean, is the U S government really not spying on its citizens? They are. Well, I think that I, I agree. I totally agree. But they do it covertly where China is overtly. So the, the, I think I view it as like a- What's the difference? Who fucking well, cares? I, I, view, I, well, I, I think it is a difference because it's, it pushes, it pragmati pragmatically speaking about the current infrastructure, it may be identical. So technically speaking, it may be identical. However, I do think it, it's like a signal for the future. If you can outwardly criticize a government, that means the citizenry has an, a- greater likelihood of disrupting the governance than if you could in China. I'm by no means saying that, uh, yeah, I'm by no means saying that uh, you could say that there's a, the same amount of lack of freedoms in the United States versus China. You had definitely have freedoms in America that you do not have in China. But I was definitely pointing out that, I mean, the surveillance state I know. goes globally. Everybody is surveilling in different ways. Granted in America, you don't have CCTV cameras on every street doing facial recognition, but that's also a yet. How long yeah. until New York City? Dude, you I got a, I got a red, I got a red light camera. I got a $190 ticket for going 40 and a 35. Like, so I just, it's like, I, to me, that's a blatant, I mean, how is that constitutional to have, I mean, but that's what it is, like you say. And then it's just an extension well, of that policy. Well. I could tell you how that is constitutional, by the way, because the government, the government, the government wants to keep its citizens safe and it's yeah. their job to keep their citizens safe. So if it's proven that a traffic, you know, camera can keep you safe, then there is still some constitutional argument in this specific case, but you know, couldn't in terms you make of that life, case, couldn't you extend that everywhere? I mean, if safety is the, is the, yeah, is that, the safety is the net safety is the thing yeah. that always gets abused. You know, yeah. in Singapore, when you walk out of my family's house and you turn left out of the door and you click open on the elevator from their apartment, there's a camera and it says CCTV camera is watching you, you know? And like, that's within five feet of their home that they live in and sleep in. Um, yeah. So that's the trade-off, right? Safety versus privacy. They have safety versus privacy. And yeah, we all got to, I, I feel we, I feel like <clears throat> you caught me in the sense that I'm personally okay giving up my, uh, privacy in the case of a red light camera. If they, they did it in that case, I feel okay. Whereas like when you take my picture at the airport for my facial recognition and you're like collecting my biometrics, I feel violated. Um, mm. and you know, well, to be transparent, I'm figuring this out on my own. Yeah, <laughs> <I'm> same here. <laughs> I can't yeah, tell you dollar. from figuring it all out, uh, yeah. trying to figure out what's right and, uh, where I'm going to live and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, I feel you, man. It's must've been a terribly disruptive to be pulled out of your home, especially. And yeah, I we think left four days before, and yeah, we left four days before 
rockets fell basically in my backyard <sighs> after the after Russia invaded Ukraine. And uh, I, I, I basically left because I wanted to get to Ethereum Denver and I didn't want to leave to Ethereum Denver without my family not being in Ukraine because we were scared that the airport will, will close. We were not mm -hmm. scared. I wasn't planning all this thinking that rockets are going to actually fall in Kiev. We thought that the East would pick up. Let's pack up. Let's just move to go to Barcelona or rent a hotel. And then I'll go from there, uh, to, to Denver, um, to mm. the Ethereum conference. And even at the conference, people were asking me like, is anything going to happen? Is everything okay? I'm like, everything's going to be fine. And oh, it wasn't four days, you know, three days into the conference in Denver, I got a call that like it scary stuff's happening. It started, you know, Russia has invaded Ukraine. Isn't it amazing how, when these things happen, they just shift the tectonic plates of reality. And then that's the new baseline. It's just, okay, then that's normal from there on out. And it just, to me, this past few years have showed me personally, you know, you can read history books, but until you live it, you can't feel it, that things can change a lot quicker than people, than the base raiders say. And yeah, that's the reality of it. Well, I hope this is not a new normal and I hope that Ukraine will prevail and get its land back because it's, it's, I'm not willing to accept, uh, nearly 15 or 20% of the country being just handed to Russia. I think uh, Ukraine has a right to fight back and to ask for people's help and we should do whatever we can to support them, uh, in every way, which possible, we should arm Ukraine to defeat Russia. And, you know, as I said before, one country stands for freedom and one country doesn't. So yeah. I think it's very, very simple. Yeah. Yeah. Well, glad to hear you guys made out of there and congrats on all the success you've had thus far. I'm, I'm rooting for you. It's been awesome to get to know you more, Hartej. Thank you, Mike. It's been a pleasure. I'll speak to you very soon. All right. Take it easy, man. Stay in Bye. touch.